and I would like to invite Sandra Holdsworth, uh, Chantal Bemour, and Isabel Doré to come to the stage for their session called Working Together to Optimize Long-Term Health Status and Wellness in the Context of Liver Transplantation, a Holistic View. Sandra Holdsworth, a former banker, underwent a liver transplant in 1997 due to a rare liver disease in Crohn's disease. Despite living with a permanent ostomy, uh, chronic kidney disease, and PTSD, she now advocates for organ and tissue donation and works as a patient partner co-lead with the CDTRP, focusing on long-term outcomes and mentoring others on their healthcare journey. Chantal Bemour is a nutrition specialist and professor at the University de Montreal who focuses on liver disease and its complications. She conducts research, collaborates with medical departments, and has been recognized for her work in developing nutrition guidelines for liver disease. Her laboratory is part of the research center at the University of Montreal, and her research is supported by various organizations. Uh, and Isabel Doré is a so sociology trained assistant professor and researcher at the Université de Montréal. Her work centers around using physical activity to improve mental health in various populations, including adolescents, young adults, cancer patients, and immunosuppressed individuals. Um, I'll give the floor to you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So I'm very pleased and very excited to be uh, here this afternoon. So um, we will, uh, in fact, talk about nutrition, exercise, mental health uh, in the context of transplantation. We will put a little bit on the emphasis on uh, liver transplantation, but I think that our thoughts will be applicable to uh, any kind of transplantation, in fact. So the main objective of, of our um, of our panel discussion this afternoon is really to engage in a dialogue uh, to, to try to appreciate the, the patient's lived experiences. And we want to do that in order to be able to establish a meaningful understanding of the reality of the patients, but also to guide future research uh, on the, the patient's needs. So before, before starting, we would like to uh, just talk a little bit a little bit more about us. Uh, we've been introduced, a uh, very nice introduction, but uh, what we like to call ourselves is a holistic team, and we want to like um, to adopt a holistic approach. So I'm a nutrition expert. Uh, I'm a dietitian, in fact, registered dietitian, and uh, I was uh, recently honored to be uh, designated as a, a CDTRP Team 5 uh, co-lead along with Sandra and Tom. So it's very recent, but I'm quite excited to be part of the, the team now. Uh, and I will let uh, Sandra and Isabel introduce themselves, and then we will go on with our presentation, and we will have a fruitful discussion at the end. So I'm Sandra Holdsworth. Um, I'm a patient partner with lived experience. And my lived experience is as a liver transplant recipient for 27 years. At the same time, I was diagnosed with my disease of primary sclerosis and cholangitis. I was told I had Crohn's or colitis. And after 16 years of being on prednisone, it's one of the reasons why my legs don't work that great and other reasons, um, I ended up getting a permanent ileostomy. Um, I, I currently right now have stage four chronic kidney disease and uh, one year post-transplant, I was diagnosed with primary uh, PT, oh, sorry, I was diagnosed with PTSD. As uh, Chantal mentioned, I'm the patient lead on theme five, long-term outcomes. Over to you, Isabel. Thank you so much, Sandra. So I'm Isabel Doré, and as it was mentioned, I was initially trained in sociology, but I'm actually an epidemiologist and professor in kinesiology. So I'm part of a holistic approach, but I'm a holistic person too, I think, <laughs> with influence from uh, public health, sociology, um, epidemiology, and physical activity. So um, I've developed an expertise in physical activity uh, and mental health promotion, uh, which was initially developed in, in young adults and adolescents. And 
as a matter of fact, I just uh, came up to have like so many amazing colleagues from the CDTRP and at Shim Research Center who were actually involved and doing work in transplant population, but also with caregivers uh, in transplantation. So I just end up during COVID being involved in so many amazing projects and it seems that I stick around. So um, I'm really happy to collaborate with those amazing people. And yeah, and I met Sandra actually in this research project during COVID. Yeah. So you want to take over? Yeah. Should I sit? Uh, I can stand here. I can stand. Oh, okay. I can stay here. Sorry. It's totally okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, we wanted to start with uh, that really simple infographic presenting a uh, wellness component. So as you probably know, uh, health is much more than not being sick, but I think it's still really important to um, to mention it and to say it again, because for a long time, and even for, and even now for some people, um, being healthy is not being sick. Being having good mental health is not having a disorder, for example, which is not the case. Yeah. So being uh, healthy, uh, being able to uh, access a high level of well-being of wellness is actually a, a balance between physical, mental, emotional cultural and spiritual okay. health. And so when we Sienna, talk about wellness and well-being, we actually sometimes okay, also include um, the aspect related to social yeah, well-being. Yeah. Uh, I about half of that. Relationships. You're concerned that she's leaning to one side, so you want to do what? Uh, and also aspect from our uh, environment. There has been increasing interest in recent years, and I would say probably the last 20, 30 years, sure about lifestyle, uh, especially physical activity and nutrition as potential and now effective strategy to actually improve well-being, improve wellness, and reduce the risk of developing both physical and mental um, health issue in the future. So uh, we will, Sandra, me, and Chantal, uh, depict the portrait of the research uh, in general and specifically in the transplant population uh, regarding those researchers who actually investigate the potential effect of physical activity and nutrition on various aspects of well-being and wellness. Okay, so this little graphic here is my way of trying to explain how um, mental health, uh, nutrition, and exercise work together. So if you look at the top, and I use little like um, brains because we're talking about how we feel. So if we're depressed, we're anxious, we're sleepy, we didn't get a lot of sleep, which is very common with transplant recipients. We have low energy, it could be because our hemoglobin is low and mine is right now. Um, um, and you're dizzy because of the medications you're taking or your blood pressure is low or- you know, Actually, just, well, I just have another question while I have um, one thought. So in order to I, exercise, I was just you need there. to feel good. So we're told, well, you know what? If you exercise, you're gonna feel good, but you need to have that mindset in order to do that. Then it's, whoops, then it's really important to feed your body, right? And uh, in order to do that, um, you know, for me personally, it's hard depending on my, on your diet. So right now, like I have a liver issue, I have kidney issues and I have Crohn's disease, uh, right? So they're all different diets and nobody ever knows how to help me. I have one team that's saying, you know, you need to eat more protein. Don't do this. Look, so, and it's like, to me, I just feel like, you know what? I shouldn't eat. And that's why I think I've always been overweight is because I didn't overeat. I just didn't eat. And when I did eat, it was usually carbs. Um, and then, so then it's like, well, if you're feeling good and you're eating properly, then you should exercise. And then what's the way to do that? Well, I think is like, um, having someone that you're accountable to, like, you know, I, I, so having a friend, let's go for a walk. Um, what I used to do is I, I didn't do exercise, like, you know, other than back in the eighties, we used to do those, uh, you know, seven minute workouts or whatever they called, I can't remember. And, uh, you know, the, uh, super fitness, but, um, I always played sports. I, I, you know, I grew up playing baseball. I used to play hockey with my brothers. Um, you know, I love table tennis and stuff like that. So any kind of sport that you like, and there's a lot of things about walking, right? So, you know, I still try to walk and, uh, we have nice, nice, beautiful trails where we are. I try, you know, I use my, my stick so I don't fall. Another great way is, uh, to do it is to dance. And we have our friend over here, Manuel, uh, who uh, will teach us how to do that. And, uh, 
who has taught us how to do that. And that can be done like tomorrow night. I'll see you guys on the dance floor. They'll be having to put me on a chair and do the chair exercises. Um, and so when you do all this, you're going to feel better. And then it's good for your liver. It's good for your other organs and things like that. So that's what we want to try to get to. So I'll leave it over to you now. Thank you, Sandra. So now we will move on to some of uh, very brief uh, re uh, study results. Like I will talk about uh, nutrition and then uh, Isabel will talk about physical activity and mental health, and then we will uh, start the discussion. So just to give you a, a brief overview, I will do, I give you some facts about, about nutrition before and ever after liver transplantation since, since it's my expertise. So as you may know, uh, when the, the liver is dif dysfunctioning, uh, since it is a very important organ in our body, uh, it will result in several, um, several deleterious effects. So one of them is poor dietary intake, since uh, it, it, it can be characterized by, by early satiety. Uh, also malabsorption, uh, specifically uh, of vitamins. Uh, there is also disturbance of many substrate utilizations, such as proteins, lipids, and also uh, carbohydrates uh, characterized by insulin resistance. And uh, it may also result in hypermetabolism, uh, which will result uh, in, um, in uh, increased energy uh, expenditure. So all of these factors may, um, uh, alone or in combination, result in malnutrition, but uh, as well as uh, in the sarcopenia, which is the loss of muscle mass and uh, muscle quality as well. And what is important to remember is that malnutrition and sarcopenia uh, are uh, present in uh, the majority of, the, of people living with, uh, with uh, chronic liver disease. So what's happening after liver transplantation? So it's just really a, a brief overview. Uh, these are the results from a, a cross-sectional study that, were, uh, that was performed at the Centre Hospitalier de l'Université de Montréal, where we are conducting our research. And what we can see on this graph is we have uh, people that were transplanted in 2019, which is the, the gray bar, 2020, the orange bar, and 2021, which is the blue bar. And what ba basically what it says is that up to three years after liver transplantation, patients are still at risk of malnutrition, sarcopenia, and frailty. So it's quite concerning. And then the, the last result that I wanted to show you uh, in relation with nutrition is, uh, is nutrition before and after liver transplantation. This is uh, a result that was published, uh, a study that was published uh, last year, a retrospective study performed at the Centre Hospitalier de l'Université de Montréal once again. And what it shows you is that if you see a uh, People that have been transplanted that were suffering for, from sarcopenia, there are a, a big majority of the, the patients that are still uh, suffering from sarcopenia after liver transplantation. And this is three months after transplantation. And what is even more concerning is that for people that have been transplanted but that were not suffering from sarcopenia before the transplantation, some of them will develop sarcopenia after transplantation. So that is quite uh, concerning. And just to like conclude the, on the nutrition part, these are the general nutritional recommendations. So, because once you have a liver transplantation, what, when, once you have been transplanted, what usually we said is that you can go back to your, eventually to your normal uh, diet, but it's not always the case. These are general recommendation uh, according to the Canada Foods Guide, Food Guide that was published in 2019. So we put the emphasis on uh, uh, vegetable, fruits, grains, uh, water. And uh, we also have a part uh, just not focusing on the, the, the food itself, but also uh, to, to, um, to in fact know the context in which you, you eat your food. So you could, uh, you know, eat with people, cook more often, uh, uh, enjoy your food. So these are all the, the kind of messages that we want to give to the patients. But what is important is to adapt these recommendations. Like Sandra said earlier, she had different conditions, you know, so it's, uh, we, we want to adapt the recommendations to different health conditions. So if you still have liver disease, kidney disease, uh, uh, problem with, uh, with your, um, 
your intestine, for example. So it's important to adapt these recommendations and to make the message clear. And the last thing that I wanted to show, maybe it's a, another way of putting the, the general recommendations. Maybe you've heard of Mediterranean diet. So that's another way that we can uh, recommend uh, our uh, the patients to to heat. But once again, it's really very important to to adapt these recommendations and uh, to consult a, a, a nutrition expert to know exactly how to apply these uh, these recommendations. So now I will let Isabel talk about mental health. Can I borrow the, of course. thank you so much, Chantal. Yeah. Um, okay, so before jumping in physical activity, um, when we were preparing that panel and presentation, Sandra said, I think it's really important to make the point of what's the state, what do we know about um, people uh, being going through transplantation regarding their mental health? Uh, so I think it's really important to take a time and just look at the research and what we've known about um, those uh, those mental health challenges and issue in that specific population. So um, depression and anxiety are the most common mental uh, health problem or disorder in transplant population. Uh, there's a couple of research investigating uh, also caregiver, patient, and donors, but to be totally honest, there's not a lot of them uh, reporting um, mental health issue and challenges in this specific population. So, um, Oh, we don't see all the picture here, but uh, just to give you an idea, uh, there's many, many research who have reported various prevalence of anxiety and depression in transplant population, but we have a really recent, it's 2021, uh, systematic review that actually grouped 62 studies um, from uh, various transplantation uh, sites uh, who report that up to 46.9% uh, percent of the, the solid organ recipient do actually experience high level of depressive symptoms that could potentially lead to a depression diagnosis. Uh, and up to 66.7% of them do actually experience high level of anxiety symptoms who can potentially be an indication of a potential uh, anxiety disorder. Uh, just being managing those kind of symptoms and having a, an anxiety or depression uh, diagnosis, it's like solely really, really concerning and challenging. But it's even more challenging knowing that depression is associated with poor health outcomes and mortality in transplant um, population. So more specifically, we know that people who actually do experience high level of de depressive symptoms um, or who have uh, a depressive uh, diagnosis are at higher risk of graft loss and a higher risk of mortality after uh, transplantation. So uh, we touched this a little bit before. Uh, this is uh, This is where I concentrate all my research uh, on physical activity and mental health. So I would not say that I'm a really big expert in uh, transplant population, but uh, I do have new research regarding physical activity and mental health. So we know now um, that physical activity is not only promising, but effective in reducing the risk of mental disorder, but also promoting well-being um, and positive mental health. We know that physical activity uh, impacts positively mental health through uh, stress reduction that are usually really common in general population, but especially in clinical population following, for example, cancer, uh, cancer diagnosis or transplantation um, or different surgery or um, treatment. We know also that physical activity helps uh, improve self-esteem, self-control, or determinants of positive mental health and well-being. We know that it helps improve moods um, and then reduce the risk of anxiety and depressive symptoms. However, what do we know regarding physical activity and its impact on mental, on mental health outcomes in transplant population? Um, the simple and quick answer is very little. To be totally honest, when uh, I started during COVID uh, investigating physical activity, sedentary behavior, and mental health in transplant population in the specific context of COVID, uh, we look for other research uh, looking at physical activity and mental health in transplant population, and there's very, very few research targeting those two aspects in that specific population. So um, there is some, uh, but there's a need for uh, increasing research and much more research to better document these. 
However, uh, as probably many of you knows, and I think there's many participants of that study, uh, we conduct during COVID the COVID immuno study as part of the Projet Laurent study. So uh, the Projet Laurent is a really large project, uh, really interest in pet ownership and the impact of pets in potential risks. To And we want to study that to better develop recommendation and guidelines for both patient, family, uh, doctors, and veterinarian. But we also want to document the benefits of pet ownership on both lifestyle and mental health. So as part of that really large One Health project, we conduct a study during the COVID, um, and we were actually interested to look at does physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep do actually impact or no um, mental, various mental health um, um, indicators in transplant people, immunosuppressed people, donor, family, caregiver um, um, uh, of transplant people. So we actually conduct the first data collection couple of weeks following COVID-19 uh, inception in 2020. We had a second cycle in 2021. And in between the 2020 and 2021, we had actually a large, quite large sample of participants who complete 30 daily assessments to report their daily activities, their daily sleep, their daily sedentary behavior, and emotion on a daily basis to help us investigate actually those associations between uh, physical activity, movement behavior, and mental health. So I will just uh, touch base because there's not a lot of uh, research on physical activity and mental health. Um, I will just touch base really quickly on those results. So we had a, um, for the first cycle data collection in 2020, 137 participants who were involved in that first uh, study. The majority of them were transplant recipient, but we had almost 20% who were family um, member or relative and also a couple of donors. Others were people who were immunosuppressed, but not from um, organ, uh, not organ recipients. Uh, we had also a really great variety according to age. So we had some adolescents who participate in the study. Uh, the majority of the participants were adults between uh, 18 and, and 55 years old and a couple of older adults as well. Okay, so I will just present quickly those results who have been recently published, um, where we were interested to actually depict um, the change in behavior of physical activities and entry time and sleep, but I will not present the result for sleep today, uh, just try to depict those change following COVID-19. And uh, just, I will, I will say that uh, right now, because I think it's really interesting that the COVID-19 here is used as this really major stressful life event that the whole population experience. But in the discussion of that paper, um, we actually propose or make the hypothesis that COVID-19 is a stressful life event that could, in some aspect, be similar, although totally different, but some, some aspect could be similar to the transplantation. So the idea is to say, like, in the, in the context of a really highly stressful life event, the change, we, 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 we usually have some change in our lifestyle behavior and how those change to impact our mental health. So we were uh, interested and we asked participants uh, whether, um, what were their physical activity and sedentary behavior before COVID and since COVID. And uh, we group people in three different groups. So those who decrease actually their physical activity following COVID, those who remain stable, though, so they didn't change their, their behavior and those who actually increase their physical activity. And this was um, really interesting in that population and it was really similar to what we observe in the general population. So if you look at the table, we have those who decrease and those who increase. And if we look at anxiety symptoms, you see that people who actually decrease physical activity following COVID do experience much more anxiety symptoms compared to those who remain stable or those who actually increase their physical activity, suggesting that uh, a non lt change in that kind of behavior could be potentially associated with higher risk of presenting anxiety symptoms. Uh, in this table, we look at sedentary behavior. So again, we compare people who actually decrease sedentary behavior, which, has, which is actually a good thing. Uh, those who remain stable in their sedentary behavior and those who increase their sedentary behavior. And really interestingly, we see that people who actually increase their sedentary behavior experience much more uh, symptoms of psychological distress, much more anxiety and depressive symptoms compared to people who actually decrease those sedentary behavior or, or remain stable. 
Um, so to conclude that part, I will just quickly talk about uh, prehabilitation. So prehabilitation has been proposed as a really innovative and really interesting uh, and effective strategy to uh, actually build and foster both physiological and psychosocial reserve in various patients, including uh, transplant recipient. So prehabs target the really specific time between diagnosis, for example, and could be related to cancer or other type of surgery or transplantation. But since the announcement of the need for a transplantation, for example, and the surgery. So we target that specific period to actually improve and build and foster the res their health reserve in order to um, reduce the incidence or the severity um, of, uh, of symptoms associated with the surgery. It's actually attenuate the physical deconditioning and help, I'm sorry, and help, I'm sorry, uh, and help recover the capacity and the minimal functioning much more uh, quickly. Uh, just for your interest, there's a lot of research who have been done uh, in prehabilitation in patient, and there's increasing number of research targeting caregivers. So we know now that caregivers can actually benefit from prehab, even if they are not the one who are receiving, uh, receiving the surgery, for example. So we have currently a project in cancer patients who actually target uh, caregivers. Uh, Multimodal prehabilitation uh, has been uh, proposed recently and suggests increased benefits for general health, both physical and, me uh, and mental health. So compared to um, uh, more standard or unimodal prehabilitation that targets exercise specifically, multimodal uh, prehabilitation aims to get together physical activity component, nutrition, and psychosocial um, uh, counseling. So together, they all um, they all present better um, uh, outcomes on both physical and mental health of patients. And I will finish with uh, with this. Um, there's not a lot of study uh, targeting prehabilitation, and I know there's a couple of uh, expert in prehab and transplantation, so uh, they might have uh, comments or suggestions for that. But there's a couple of recent study published last year and this year who suggest that pre uh, prehabilitation prior to liver transplantation is actually seems a uh, feasible, safe, have short term benefits on functional status and improve aerobic capacity. So there's a couple of trials going on right now that suggest that prehab in liver transplantation do actually have positive impact. Uh, for those of you who know ERAS, so ERAS are early recovery after surgery. It's a worldwide um, uh, initiative, uh, and there were ERAS guidelines who were delivered for the first time in 2016 and were specific to liver surgery, and they were actually revised recently in 2022 and published recently in 2023, um, who actually recommend prehabilitation for high-risk patients um, who will receive liver uh, surgery. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you about PROMS. So everyone mostly probably knows about what PROMS are, patient reported outcome measures. And what they're able to do is they assess health and, and the status of a, uh, of a patient at a, at a specific time. And it also helps measure the impact of intervention. But it's also, it's also from the patient's perspective. But it, for me, it's like, it sort of sets the stage for your clinic visit. So you indicate like what, you know, things that you want to discuss and that. So um, I've got done some work with uh, Istvan, Dr. Istvan Mucci at Toronto General. And I started on the project with Samantha Anthony, Dr. Samantha Anthony at Sick Kids. And as part of my work I'm doing with the, uh, in Ontario with uh, System Transformation, we're really wanting to implement PROMS and, and PROMS following that. And so when uh, we talked, I think I believe it was uh, uh, my uh, my friends there, my peers, uh, Sherry and Rick talked about this with their presentation. Um, if we're going to do this for mental health, and like I really think we should do it for everything. And why I like it is because one of the things about mental health is um, well, the first thing that I found is that when I would go to clinic for the many many years that I would as long as my blood work was good and everything looked stable, as far as my team was concerned, I was healthy, everything was fine. Um, and when I look at like research or what people are looking at, a lot of times in the past, it was being how long does your, the graph survive? How long is this organ lasting and, and the transplant recipient? But what more important, what is more important to transplant recipients 
is not as a matter of how long it's going to last. What is my quality of life going to be? And those are the things that are important to us. So like there's this, you know, looking forward and when we do healthcare is like what matters to you? Like, and that should start the conversation. What's important to you? So that's uh, one of the things that I'm hoping that part of the work we're doing with all of the things that do with long-term outcomes that we can use PROMS in our, our clinics. Over to you. Thank you very much, Isabel and uh, Sandra. So now we will uh, begin our the discussion part. So the most, uh, I think, interesting part of our of our discussion this afternoon. Uh, so uh, we will have a poll in just a couple of minutes, but the first, we have three questions to ask uh, Sandra and the audience, uh, both in person, but also who are attending uh, by Zoom. So uh, the first question that we wanted to ask uh, Sandra is, how is your personal lived experience? So I think that you, you touch upon a little, uh, some of the aspects, but I think that you can share uh, that experience with us. So I'll, I'll try to do this based on, on the topics that were discussed, but I just as the top of my head, I wanted to talk about the Project Laurent that you we, uh, talked about. Um, that, that was a great project. It's all the keys of everything, but what's really important about that is those of us that got involved, there's a lot of us that did surveys, but part of it was also a group support on Zoom that was set up by the CDTRP. And three years later, we're still doing it. So, you know, we might, we meet Thursdays at four o'clock and, you know, we sometimes we always can't be there, but it's our support, it's our connection line. Because one of the things I found that uh, the affect our mental health and transplant recipients, and as I said, we've already, it was already there to begin with, it was already an epidemic to begin with, to be honest with you, is that um, we felt isolated and not being able to get together with our people, that really affected us. Um, so when I talk about my experience, I'll talk a little bit about prehab. So when I was told that, you know, someday I would need a liver transplant, and then when I went on the list in 1996, um, I was basically told to go, go home and not get sick. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll do that. I'm going to be in my house and we're going to do anything, right? But now that in, in, in retrospect, I think maybe like, Someone could have said, well, you know, while you're sitting on the couch, although you don't have any energy, you know, do like uh, leg pumps that will help you with your water or, you know, maybe try to walk a little bit because you're going to be having a major surgery and you're going to need your stamina to do that. Um, when I when I first went for my assessment, when you look at the things that we were talking about, I had a one time assess assessment on my mental health, and that was just to clear me to make sure I was capable of getting a transplant. Following my transplant, I did meet with a nutrition a person. My recollection of that was I was given the, the food guide and having someone who's been following every single diet right back from the banana diet in the 80s, um, I'm like, that doesn't work for me. You know, I have, I have Crohn's disease, you know, I have a hard time with salad and vegetables and stuff. And um, with exercise, there wasn't really much that was, was given. And I've said that a few times with the people that I'm working with, and then I'm uh, a little bit of a person who tends to keep medical notes and that so I can look back. And I did notice that there were notes, and I think it was from when you get home, like it's different in every province, but when you get uh, care at home, there was a little thing about some of the exercises you could do. But I think that was to get me from the bed to be able to get out and start doing things. There was no focus on long-term and that. Um, and then, um, to be honest with you, um, nobody ever asked me how my mental health was doing. I don't know if those of you remember uh, a movie it was called, um, oh, I can't remember, I'll come back to it. That. But one year post-transplant, so six months after I went back to work and I worked in banking and uh, I, my job had changed. So I was now managing, a, we had a, taken over a company of another bank. So I was, my job was to sort of bring these people on board, which was hard enough to begin with. Uh, so I wasn't back with my branch with all my customers and that. And one year, one day at night, I was sitting at my desk and I'm just like, I, don't, I, I just can't focus. I don't know what to do, what's going on. I called my family doctor and I drove right down from like, you know, an hour and a half 
to see her and she says, Sandra, you have PTSD. And, you know, I was always, you know, sort of under the impression, like, you know, you don't, you can't be depressed, like, you know, suck it up and, you know, be strong and stuff like that. And I realized, actually, to be honest with you, which is sort of how bad the stigma was, that I said, oh, wow, like, I almost feel like I'd be wanting to have another transplant and be told this, right? Because I felt like I failed, which then, then, and when I started to get help and looked at it, like, my cousin died at the same time that I was waiting for my uh, uh, transplant. She was the same age as me, one year older, and she died of cancer. And I'm like, why, why did she live? And why, why did I live? And she did it. Then my uncle died of liver disease, happened to do that on my birthday. And so like all these things build up. But then you also realize like you were looking at like not being here and your whole life like disappearing and stuff like that. So I found that was really hard. And uh, when it comes to the diet, like, you know, now my experience is that, you know, with, like I said, I have Crohn's, but I also have an ileostomy. It really changes what you can eat and how you eat. And like having Crohn's and even having that, it's very difficult to digest salads and, and vegetables. And I, for some reason, I just, you know, when I was younger, I could eat a whole breast of chicken. Now I could feel like hardly eat anything and stuff. So I just find that I, you know, and I, the other thing is too, when it comes to what I call like um, getting these other kinds of services as part of the holistic approach, I'm now followed by a kidney team uh, just south of where I live and they provide what I call integrated care. And I, I'm, I'm all about integrated care. I do a lot of work on that. I go there, I get, I get measured, I get, uh, go see a nurse talk to her about everything. And depending on who's available, I go see the nutritionist, then I go see the pharmacist and I wait for the doctor. If I feel like I needed to see a social worker, I just need to let them know before I come. And then I go see the doctor, get my medication. And even my husband who's been my caregiver, we walk out of there and we went, wow, that was amazing, right? But I don't know what, like how that they're able to do that there, but in the, in the transplant clinic, especially down at a big city in Toronto, where I go, there's so many people, like when I was waiting for my transplant, there was probably 80 on the list. There's probably over 250 for liver right now and people waiting. And so like, I don't expect my transplant clinician to deal with my mental health, but I want them to first acknowledge that mental health could be a situation and um, and the importance of my nutrition and exercise. And even to say like, you know, like you need to, well, you know, watch your weight, you gotta watch your diet and things like that. I think people sometimes even our GPs are afraid to say that too, because they don't wanna hurt our feelings. But when I've asked about, well, why didn't anyone talk to me about mental health? They said, well, you had so much on your plate. And I said, well, you don't think that I knew that? And uh, why I think, why I'm so passionate about getting all these done is like, you know, being, having a huge network of friends that are like waiting or have had their transplant. I really noticed a lot of people that were, you know, who normally would be out and about and they were drawn back. And when I reached out, they would say, oh, you know, I'm just not feeling good. I think, and then, so then I just went, this is it. I just went on Facebook and I said, here's the research. Did you know within one to two years, if you're a transplant recipient, you're going to have a mental health? It's not your fault. It's because of what you went through. Seek help. And so that's what we're trying to do. So I really like to think that, and as part of theme five, I really like to think about now as we move forward, that we need to bring mental health, exercise, and nutrition back together and make it focus. And so that our patients our, and our caregivers and those donors that we, you know, donor families and living donors, that they get the services that they require and deserve. Thank you so much, Sandra, for uh, sharing that with us. It's very, uh, very inspiring. So now uh, what we, want, we wanted to do is to uh, do a poll. So we have two, essentially the same questions, but we would like to have answer, for answers from the patients, family, and donors, and also and answers for uh, from the clinicians and researchers. And we would we will comment on the the answers after that. So I will put on the screen uh, a Slido uh, QR code, so uh, people also uh, that are uh, attending uh, by Zoom, you can uh, join us. 
So we will let a couple of minutes to uh, for you to answer. So I will read the question. Uh, it's a, <laughs> a good point. <laughs> so how often have you discussed physical activity and or nutrition strategies with your clinical team? And for clinicians and researchers, so how often have you discussed physical activity and or nutrition strategies with patients? So is it working now? Yeah, yeah good. Oh. oh, thank you. That's really cool. <laughs> so now we can see the, the, uh, the answers. Yeah, so there's three response options. Sometimes, never, often. So this is the question for patient, right? And family and for the yeah. Can uh, Stephanie? Can you put the answer there or not? Okay. No. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is what I had to do yesterday. <laughs> okay. Um... Okay, so the first question was addressed to uh, the, the, the patients. So we have 46% uh, that are saying that they discuss sometimes physical activity and or nutrition strategies. 36% which uh, never discussed it and 18% uh, which discuss, discuss it often. So 36% is quite a big number, never discussing it. What do you think, uh, Sandra? <laughs> so that was all the patients that completed that, right? So uh, yeah, it is. And, uh, and, and that's sad because like, my transplant was 27 years ago. So what, what have we learned? Mm -hmm. Right. And like my friend Sylvain said yesterday, like, you know, what have we learned from all the work that we're doing? What can we do better? And, and this is important because our, you know, we didn't do transplants for patients not to do well. Mm -hmm. You know, like I know I'm going to be 60 next year, but I should be able to walk up those stairs. Yeah. You know, and I have Scarpius, but I, the one I can never say it with my friend Tanya, Scarpinia mm -hmm. <laughs> and frailty and malnutrition because I'm not getting nutrition because of my, my, my ileostomy. So, but. And, and that's a good point that you're mentioning because traditionally we were focusing on survival, yeah. but now we try to focus more and more because survival is uh, a lesser issue now, but we try to focus on quality of life and we yeah. think that it goes through uh, physical activity, nutrition, and mental health, among, among other things. So mm -hmm. I think it's quite uh, important and interesting uh, results. I don't know if someone in the room would like to share or if you have any questions regarding these, uh, these results before we go on to the next uh, question. Anything to share? Not sure if this is part of your questionnaire or or however you're conducting your research, but what are the barriers? Mm -hmm. Right. So I think um, I think everybody understands that physical activity can have a can have an effect on mental health. But what are patient specific barriers that prevent them from being able to do that? So I think that's yeah. It's a focus. it's a great question. Maybe I can answer regarding nutrition uh, and. Maybe Sandra and uh, Isabel, you want to uh, to complete. When we uh, we um, we um, formulated the, the nutrition in cirrhosis guide a couple of years ago with uh, Dr. Penita Tendon in Edmonton, and we did some focus group with uh, patients as well as their caregivers. And uh, what was uh, the, the main the main barrier? I would say is that it's all mixed up because it's it's complicated. The message is not simple enough. Uh, if we look at, uh, you know, uh, when Sandra is sharing her, her experience, she has several health conditions. So how do we reconcile the uh, simply the nutritional recommendation? So that's not an easy task, but I, I think it takes time and we need to address, uh, address th this barrier. So we can do like uh, simply uh, simple educational uh, tools, but we need to talk and to share with the 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 people who is living with the the, the 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 people who is living with the condition as well as the caregiver. So I think for nutrition is 
part of the answer. It's a very, very simple uh, answer, I agree, but I think that it's an important topic uh, to address. I don't know, Sandra, or is I'll, that... I'll take on the mental health. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that our doctors are having mental health issues right now. Um, so, and we have a major mental health issue before COVID came, not just within the transplant community, but everywhere. Like, and uh, access to treatment is not very good as well. Also, there's a fee for people who don't have private coverage to get it. And also, um, you know, it comes to like priorities, like the transplant team can only do so much, right? So then it's like what we talked about this morning. I said, like, if we have data that shows that, you know, there's a huge population in the transplant community with mental health, then we can change policy so that we could get funding for that. So hospitals can have funding for it. Right now, they don't have enough. They're doing transplant. They're doing patients that are in clinic as well. Um, but then when it comes to exercise, I look at like the Heart and Stroke Foundation, right? I think when my dad had a stroke, he, I think it was like he paid $100 and he had a place that he could go to, right? And so like if we had places like that, but I remember like um, when I went to go say, okay, well, I'm going to go into a gym and work out. I picked this place called Curves. And first time I went in there, I saw someone like, you know, like burning nose and, you know, putting their stuff on the machine and then they didn't wipe down. And I'm like, I'm not doing this, right? So there's also being able to do it safely and also in the environments that we can do it on, so. Um, I will just start saying that it's quite encouraging, I think, percentage that we see here, because I think the same question 10 years ago would probably have been like 99% never, or basically. Um, regarding the barriers, I think it's a really interesting question, and we can answer both um, the barriers of discussing physical activity and the barriers for doing physical activity. So I think the most important barrier for both is usually time. So uh, clinicians say that they don't have time during their consultation. There's so many things to address um, that physical activity just, just fall really low in the priority and they don't have time. And regarding doing physical activity, it takes time. It takes like an appointment with yourself, for example, to do physical activity. So it's also a, a big challenge. I think the other challenge that has been really highly reported in the literature is not knowing what to do or not knowing what to recommend. So we don't have good training for our clinician, both doctor and nurse regarding healthy lifestyle, uh, especially physical activity. Um, we don't yet have really uh, multidisciplinary clinical team, including kinesiologists, for example, it's getting better. We have, I think, large improvement in Canada for that, but it's not it's not totally integrated in all the care teams. Um, and I have conduct, it's not in transplantation, but in cancer, uh, we have conducted a, a study among patient and clinicians regarding especially exactly the barriers to, to recommend and promote physical activity. And we, we find out that clinicians do actually recommend what they were actually doing their, themselves. And it doesn't mean that because you do something that you like, that the person in front of you will have the resource or the, um, the interest in doing that same physical activity. So I think like making a priority, making time for that, which is, I totally understand, a really big challenge, but also providing resources and ideas and ways to, to discuss, to talk, um, and provide resource to engage and remain involved in physical activity is really important. Yes, yes. thank you very much. I can also speak to what you, what you just said. I've been a caregiver for a liver patient. It's hard to eat 105 grams of protein a day, and it's costly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you think of the diverse mm -hmm. populations that need to follow these nutrition guidelines, Cost. you have your meeting with your physician or, or the nutritionist, and you go through what you can and can't eat. And then you say, is there a cookbook? Yeah. And they know, <laughs> figure it out. And um, it, it's difficult to, to maneuver through all of that. And we were able to do that, you know, eating four to five times a day. Getting getting that protein content, et cetera, it's it's really difficult, yeah. and it changes the way the whole family um, eats. Yeah, so that's an important perspective. Yeah. Kind of very very important what you are saying, especially in the context uh, presently in the social economic context. But we when I, I present, you know, the med diet, it's very beautiful and everything, the big pyramid, and but 
what, what does it cost? What so it? that's another important barrier. And I think that we need to address that also because there are some ways to, to eat properly on a limited budget, we but we have to accompany the people the people to to be able to do that, you know. And that's another tool that we need to put forward and to work on. Absolutely, that's very important. And that ties in with the caregiver piece. And yeah. it's just wonderful at this conference to hear the conversation evolving of the integration of the family caregiver participant in the in the team, and. Um, you know, Caregivers Canada has put out information about risk, longevity, et cetera, for caregivers. And for an extended illness, the caregiver has a higher risk of dying before the patient, oh, wow. which is really profound. Yeah. And um, I think there's a, a lot more work that needs to be done to support the caregiver to help the transplant patients be successful. Yeah, mental health as well. Very good point. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yes, another question, and then we will move on to the answer from the other part of the audience, because I, I see that there's only seven minutes left. It's what? interesting. Hi. Hi. Sorry. I just want to um, talk a little bit more about the barriers for physical activity. So there are many studies that have shown barriers to physical activity in transplant populations. So my group was one of the, uh, we published one of the, these papers, and what we found was that in addition to these general uh, barriers that the general population uh, face, for example, time or lack of money to, to join a gym, uh, solid organ transplant recipients also feel that um, they have, again, lack of knowledge about specific exercise that transplant recipients can do. They also are afraid of losing their organ because usually they don't hear from physicians or healthcare, uh, from the healthcare team that they can exercise. So a lot of them, believe it or not, think that they may lose their organs if they um, extreme, you know, do extreme, um, extreme exercise. Uh, so those things are things that we can address. Um, another barrier was um, side effects of medication. So that's mm -hmm. a little bit more difficult to address, but we can try to work on what these effect, effects are and if we can change um, something there in terms of time and how they can exercise. Um, I think mostly those were the, the main uh, barriers that, are, that were specific to transplant population. And thank you yeah. for this session. This is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing this. Uh, so I think we will move on to the answers from the other part of the audience. So uh, for the clinicians and the researchers, so how often have you discussed physical activity and or nutrition strategies with patients? So uh, almost half and half uh, did discuss it often and uh, sometimes and a smaller proportion that never discussed it. So I think that's quite uh, encouraging. I don't know if some people would like to comment about these results. Yes. Um, can I yeah. just call? It's a little bit about the re these results, but also about something that you mentioned yeah. as, as time being a barrier. I think we have to reframe that because I can understand time being a barrier, maybe for a, um, you know, a healthcare professional who doesn't have time to include it in the multiple of things that they have to talk about. But I think the reason why time is an issue for the participant is because potentially we've been taught that you have to do a particular amount of time or spend a particular amount of time on physical activity in order for it to be beneficial, mm -hmm. which is not the case, right? So I think, I think that's a big part of it. Like people are under the impression that you need a minimum of either 30 minutes to an hour a day to do that. And that's not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is something that you mentioned, Sandra, is that you could literally be sitting watching TV, but doing something yeah. at the same time. Yeah. So I think, you know, I, I mean, I guess I, I was, I don't know where I saw this, but it was basically um, like a little billboard of you know, it is is essentially an investment in yourself, kind of like, you know, going to get your hair done or brushing your hair or something like that. Mm -hmm. And really quantifying what 10 minutes could represent to you or for you in 24 hours, mm -hmm. right? So I think mm -hmm. we have to reframe 
the thinking that it requires time to do physical activity. Yes, very good point. Can so, I just say something like really, really yes, quickly? I'm sorry. <laughs> I really reflect on that and I really appreciate your comment. And I think we have to do as researcher and clinician a much better job at how integrating physical activity into daily living. Like how can we actually do a call while walking in the house or around the house, or we can do actually a lot of physical activity, including and introducing that in our daily living. And I think for, for many patients and people from the general population, that's where we have to go. But we don't, we, we, I, I think we're not going a good job enough so far at translating those actually physical activity guidelines into really concrete strategy to incorporate physical activity into daily living. But we can do yeah. better. Yeah, I think <laughs> we are improving, but I agree with you, Isabel, we can do a much, a lot better. So maybe a last question, and then I think we will conclude. Uh, we didn't have time to go out, but we can discuss after that. So yeah. Right, so to repeat that, transplant recipient um, having difficulties getting activity in that is structured activity. So, you know, some people may laugh and say, well, you're a mom of a toddler, you're ripping around all day anyways, but trying to get that. And I used to think of it as self-care to go and exercise. The first thing we're going to let go of when we don't feel like we have the energy is our own self-care. So when I talked to my nephrologist about this, he said, well, then I'm going to prescribe you this. You listen to me when I prescribe your medication. So I'm going to prescribe exercise. Mm -hmm. And he wrote me a prescription to exercise for 10 to 30 minutes every day in whatever way I wanted. And I have the prescription and I keep it. And it's it may sound silly, but mm -hmm. as a provider, it was so beneficial for me to sit in his office and for him to reframe that for me as a recipient, because we do let go of things that we think of as self-care first. So yeah. we're, we're going to grab something really quick to eat because we want to do something else, or we're going to let go of that 30 minute walk because we have a conference call that we need to sit on things like that. So rather than framing it as self-care to exercise or eat healthy, prescribe that to your patients the same way you do our medication, because we really, as transplant recipients, take our care seriously. And yeah. so if you can take exercise and nutrition as seriously as you take taking your medication on time, it changes that mental frame of how we're going to accept it into our lives. Yeah, and that, that's not silly at all. We had that discussion when we were preparing the, the, the panel, you know, that uh, prescription, physical activity prescription, nutrition prescription, as well as medi medica uh, medication, I don't know how to say it, yeah. but med prescription, I'm no. sorry. No. Uh, it's, yeah, it's one of the way that we can address that. And I think it's very, very interesting. So I will let maybe Sandra conclude because there are I'm gonna say one say second left. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say two <laughs> things. So one of the things also is that we need to push back on primary care to be asking these questions as well. How is your mental health? How are you doing? Well, is your exercise and nutrition? And so anyone who has an opportunity to be on a patient panel talking about primary care and integrated care. Those are the things you can push on, right? Because we do realize the transplant team do have other things like to do. But also too with PROMS again, is that this is a way, so if you get in a, a prescription like Pian just said, then when you come in, I'll say, how is your exercise program doing? How, what, what changes have you made within your diet? And that way you can track it. So back to PROMS. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, everyone. And if we want, you want to continue the discussion, we will be around. So uh, we will, it will be our pleasure. And thank you so much for listening and for participating. I think it's a very important uh, subject. And we were glad to, uh, to discuss that with you this afternoon. Thank you.